Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm in modern Vietnam, about 78 miles southwest of Hanoi. In the limestone mountains of Cuc Phuong, Vietnam's first national park, are just emerging from the dawn. Already, lights can be seen in the windows of the farmhouses on the park's border. With their traditional thatched roofs and adjacent neatly tilled fields, the farms make the scene look as quiet and serene as something on an ancient scroll. Inside the park, however, the jungle is full of sound, okay, from the drone of mosquitoes to the laughter of thrushes. Loudest of all, however, is this. Oh, there we go. Come on. Okay. Wildlife biologists call that the great call of the gibbon. That's the formal name for it, the great call. Not the ordinary call, the great call. The gibbon is the orange animal there. Jane Goodall called that one of the wonders of the primate world. And she ought to know. I mean, that's Jane Goodall. Now, primates are the biological group that includes you know, apes, humans, chimps, and us humans, among other creatures. No one knows exactly why the gibbon makes that sound. It could be marking its turf. It could be looking for a mate. Uh, it could just like to sing. Some researchers theorize that that's the attempt of our evolutionary cousin to make music. Whatever the reason, it's a sound fast disappearing from Vietnam's forests. It would be gone entirely but for the efforts of Tilo Nadler, the man in the white t-shirt. He's done more to save Vietnam's primates than anyone else, focusing especially on the very rare leaf-eating monkeys known as langors. At his rescue center in Cuc Phuong, he has 157 animals from 15 different langur species, most of which would be gone, extinct, but for him. And it includes animals such as this beautiful creature, the Duke's langur. Now, this conference is about significance and singularity. Okay, one person making a difference. I went to Vietnam to track down one of those people, someone that experts call the unsung hero of Indochina wildlife protection. I wanted to capture his experience and put it into words for a science book, Gold Rush in the Jungle, something I've been researching off and on since 1998, and it's finally being published by Crown this spring in April. Now, the key to writing popular science is to make people feel like they're in the jungle with you, among the monsoons and the leeches. You want to get inside your subject's head so people know uh, what made Tilo leave his native Germany at the age of 50, move across the world, and start a brand new life in a foreign land? Now, that requires a lot of access and rapport with your subject, which can be hard when you're dealing with someone who's, you know, 10 time zones away. And wildlife biologists can be a closed mouth group. One famous zoologist told me, you know, as a group, we're not very social. We'd rather be with animals. Okay. So here's the behind the scenes insider's view. Uh, look in the reporter's notebook of what I found in the jungles of Vietnam, minus the leeches. OK, so to get oriented, OK, so this is Vietnam. Hanoi is in the south. That's the capital of Vietnam. During the Vietnam War, or what they call the American War, that was the enemy capital. Down here, Ho Chi Minh City. That was formerly Saigon. It was our ally in the south. Just about here is the demilitarized zone, separating north from south. And over there is Laos in Cambodia. Uh, there's smaller players in Indochina. As I said, separating the two is the DMZ right along in here. And over there is Khe Son, a site of a famous battlefield. And the DMZ was picked for a particular reason. It's rainy, it's wet, it's rocky, it's very mountainous. Uh, it can rain there for 10 days in a row without a 15-minute break. Believe me, I know this. Um, now, both major cities are on large rivers, which sort of makes sense. I mean, rivers are where you can find the rice, right, find the water to grow rice. Rice is where you're going to find where the people are. Because of this, some say the map of Vietnam resembles a set of old-fashioned barbells set on end, with all the food, agriculture, and industry uh, located at one cluster in the north and another cluster in the south, with a narrow band of land in between. Others say it looks like a balance pole with a basket of rice at each end. The geography meant that there was little government oversight in the center, where a lot is unknown even to this day, and that's where they're finding a lot of random species. The same is also true in Laos and Cambodia. Now, you could call these border regions in particular the Wild West of the East. It's where smugglers, drug runners, 
indigenous tribes, tourists, and researchers all mix. There's also some people I encountered who have no fixed address or visible source of income, and they refer to themselves as expatriate scum. And uh, a, war, a prize winning war correspondent described this area in particular as uh, a very bad area full of very bad people where no NGOs want to go. And my quarry was up here. Okay, to give some background, I'm a science writer who uh, found himself editing a magazine put out by CERN in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, CERN was the home of a $10 billion, 20 year search for missing subatomic particle known as the Higgs boson, or the God particle. My job was to, to explain what they were doing in plain English, with an emphasis on computing, you know, virtual machines, grid computing, quantum theory, black holes, alternate universes, and something called quantum gravity loops. I was a, a journalism major in college. I took physics in high school. This was a real stretch. <laughs> you know, but it turned out that was exactly what they wanted. They wanted a, they wanted someone who enjoyed the, the adventure of science, who wasn't afraid of interpreting the language for the rest of us, and who wasn't afraid to, uh, to ask dumb questions, because a lot of times it was the same questions that everyone else wanted to ask as well. Okay, so what that meant was that my day job was quarks, mesons, and bosons, and the book meant that my evenings were lions, tigers, and, uh, and bears. So it really messes with your head a bit. Uh, you know, Geneva is very different from Hanoi. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was a real contrast from the neat, clean, antiseptic, orderly, punctual world of Switzerland and the dirty, muddy chaos of rural Vietnam. Okay. So back to Tilo Nadler. Okay. Uh, you remember Tilo. I mean, this is a talk about Tilo. Uh, this man single-handedly brought back some of the world's rarest animals from extinction. Born in the former East Germany and working closely with the Frankfurt Zoological Society, uh, Tilo's Endangered Primate Rescue Center spawned similar projects up and down Vietnam for turtles, fish, and wildcats, and it indirectly encouraged several more. But outside his little niche, Tilo is pretty much unknown to the outside world. Now, it's one thing for me to tell you about the animals of Vietnam, and another for you to experience them for yourselves. So, I want you to use your imagination and picture yourself on a square-bowed reed boat in the waters of Van Long Nature Reserve looking for langurs scrambling up and down the cliffs. It turns out that Vietnam's forests are home to all kinds of rare animals, most unknown to the West. Despite my impression of Vietnam as a big battlefield and nothing else, large parts remained untouched. The country is about the size of Italy, and there were many ravines, caves, and isolated areas where plants, animals, frogs, and everything else could flourish unseen. Until one day, a researcher went to a remote Bru tribes uh, people's village on the Laotian border, and she saw something unusual, some rare bones in the cooking pot. Bru tribes people called it the Sao La, and the animal is the world's largest land dweller to be found by Western science in 50 years. Its discovery set off a biological gold rush. For the past two decades, two new species have been found in Vietnam every week, 52 weeks per year. Okay, that's over the course of two decades. Some are quite large, including a rhino, an ox, and a type of barking deer. Seven of the 10 large mammals found worldwide in that period came from Vietnam. And here's just a real quick view of some of my favorites. So it's the giant Mekong catfish. All these pictures are courtesy of researchers in Vietnam. This comes from Zeb Hogan, and his official title is Explorer in Residence at National Geographic, which I think is a wonderful title to have on your business card. Yeah, it's the Anam Flying Frog, uh, which glides from tree to tree. Uh, it's from Nguyen Hao Quang, uh, Vietnam Center for Biodiversity. Okay. And there's the Eastern Saris Cranes, thought extinct on the Mekong Delta. They were brought back uh, by the, through the efforts of American and Vietnamese biologists who literally waded waist deep in the plain of reeds in order to do so. Uh, this is from Tron Treat of the International Crane Foundation. There's many more, but these are the only ones that I had permission for. I could use some in print, but not here. So try to imagine a giant turtle two meters in diameter, or a botanist rappelling down a 500 meter cliff with an endangered flowering plant between his teeth. 
There's also the fishing cat, the raccoon dog, the ferret badger, and many others still being categorized or not even photographed yet, or were discovered and became extinct, like, this, uh, like the rhinos outside Saigon. Now, the problem is that as quickly as these new animals are found, they're disappearing due to illegal timber harvesting, new dams, and highway construction. The biggest culprits, however, are the demand for exotic meats at upscale restaurants and so-called traditional medicine. Now, both businesses, it turns out, really caught on as a way of satisfying the need for a status symbol among the newly rich, as in, I'm eating rhino horn for my aches and pains. Now, never mind that, medicinally speaking, veg uh, veterinarians say that consuming rhino horn is about as effective as chewing your fingernails. Now, consequently, I learned a lot of wildlife is discovered not by going into the jungle, but go by going into the back alleys behind the restaurants and the shops. Okay. Now, one person can't save everything. So Tilo's work centered on rescuing the rarest of the rare, such as this Kat Ba Langor. There's about 60 of them in the entire world. Now, I mentioned we have a publishing date at the end of April. Now, does anyone here know the significance? Okay, to be more specific, April 29th, 1975. Okay, that was the, uh, the date of the helicopter evacuation of the US Embassy in Saigon, marking the end of America's presence in Vietnam. The war, I found out, is a fundamental part of Indochina. As a Hanoi reporter told me, you can't write about Vietnam without mentioning war any more than you can write about Saudi Arabia and not mention oil. In the past 100 years alone, there was war with America, war against the French, war against the Japanese, uh, wars against the Chinese, the Cambodians, and the Laotians. War has shaped this landscape in its natural history, and sometimes in very unexpected ways. Incredible as it may seem, and as counterintuitive it was to me, war may have actually protected Vietnam's wildlife. I'm going to repeat that. War protected Vietnam's wildlife. Why? Well, it turns out that no one wants to go hunting in a battle zone. Okay? No one wants to cut down trees that are spiked with shrapnel. Researchers have a name for this. They call it the border effect. Scientists combing through Lewis and Clark's journals found abundant wildlife whenever the explorers passed through the areas where one tribe's territory ended and another one's began. Unless war parties were deliberately going through there to uh, stage a battle, no one went to the borderlands. So consequently, wildlife flourished there. And the phenomenon holds true today. The world's largest population of endangered cranes lives between the two Koreas in the demilitarized zone. Also, there's large uh, numbers of Asian black bears and other threatened species. Now, you think about it. You've got a corridor you know, 10 miles wide and 155 miles long running the width of the Korean peninsula between two very trigger-happy armies. No one's going to go hunting there, which is why the DMZ is called the Thin Green Line. Researchers at the Crane Foundation told me that without the DMZ, there would be no cranes in Korea. In fact, the foundation is more concerned with what to do with the land after the two Koreas eventually reunite. They're looking at what happened here in Germany as a model. When the wall came down, there were already plans in place for nature reserves and parks. Now, obviously, no one's recommending war as a way of protecting wildlife. <laughs> okay. And it has to be a certain kind of very low-level conflict. Okay. Instead, what they're saying is that due to an accident of history, many rare animals managed to survive giving nature a second chance. But it is ironic that Vietnamese scientists in Hanoi should tell me uh, the peace is more dangerous than war when it comes to protecting Vietnamese wildlife. Okay. And there was another war connection as well. Uh, Tilo had an advantage because he was born and raised whoops, in the former East Germany, a brother country, oh, we got the wrong slide here, uh, to Vietnam's communist heroes. So he got a five-year head start over other researchers. Whoops. And once he was there, he didn't do any one thing right. Tilo did everything right. He got along so well with his Vietnamese interpreter that he married her. Okay. <laughs> he did field work in wildlife census surveys. He bought a car for the Vietnamese park rangers. He built local community support for the Van Long Nature Reserve. He worked with the local people and alongside them. He learned from them and he learned with them, to paraphrase the words of Senator William Fulbright in his autobiography. And Tilo spent 20 years doing it. Okay, this was wonderful grist for the book, but as a source, Tilo was reticent, more at home with monkeys than with nosy journalists. He had gone tropical. 
Now, this is a real problem for me as a writer. You know, American pop popular culture loves that one transcendent aha moment where everything all wraps it up in one phrase. But Tilo didn't do that. Whenever I asked him why he went to such lengths, he just said, look at the animals. Okay. Now, that wasn't what I was hoping for. I was in Geneva mode. I wanted everything neat and clean and you know, tidy wrapped up. I remember asking a famous biologist, Alan Rabinowitz, why he rescued endangered big cats. And he said that as a small child, he had had a bad stammer, a bad stutter. He could only work out the problems of speech when alone with animals. He used to go to the zoo, the old fashioned kind, with the concrete floors and the iron bars, and watch the jaguars pacing back and forth. And he felt that he could relate to them. They had the same thing going on. And he realized that animals have consciousness and reasoning and the ability to communicate with one another. But we don't appreciate it because they don't speak our language. So he swore to himself that if he could ever get over his study, over his stutter, he would speak for them. He would be their voice. Now, that was what I wanted from Tilo Nadler, but that didn't happen. Instead, he forced me to go into the bush and look at the animals. And I mean really look at the animals. <laughs> At the time, I was disappointed, you know. But then I got back and I looked at my notes and all my photographs, and I added it up. And I you know, survived monsoon season. I'd caught rides on the back of motorcycles through knee-deep mud. I'd gotten lost in the jungle, looked for animals in village marketplaces, and seen one of the world's rarest langors in the wild. I'd experienced the obstacles and the pleasures of Tito's fieldwork and gotten a better sense of why it took 20 years for his rescue center to become an overnight success. In the process, I came to appreciate Vietnam as a country, not a war. I realized that the journey was the destination, that doing first-person field work was the point of it all. All right, so uh, before I went to CERN, and long before I knew I was going to write a book, I came across a wonderful quote, which I put up on my bulletin board, although I didn't realize how prescient it would be. It comes from a uh, New York Times reporter, Malcolm Brown, who said that he had gotten into journalism for what he called the feel, which he called uh, direct personal experience as a prerequisite to rounded reporting. And the quote goes, he saw life itself as a vehicle for attaining the feel, and so do I. Life to him was a quest for the greatest possible range and depth of experience, including physical sensations, of course, but much more. The feel can come from a brush with quantum theory, or a Bach fugue, or a Blake sonnet as well as a bullet wound or the caress of a loved one. The feel arises from exultation, despair, agony, pleasure, and revelation, not from a TV screen. For people who truly crave the feel, the full palette, there's simply no substitute for being there. That's why journalism beckons so seductively to people like me. No other pursuit offers a practitioner such richness of experience. Whatever your calling, I encourage you to seek the feel as well. I am grateful for all my experiences in the course of doing this book, and I hope and pray that in a small way, this book will help ensure that this sound will continue to be heard in Vietnam's forests. And there we are. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation.